Welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Johannes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting Stuttgart, a supply chain persona dedicated to the automotive aftermarket. Automotive is the industry of the industries. The automotive uh, aftermarket alone is a very large industry, about the same scale as fashion or aviation. In Europe, in 2022, there are 560 passenger cars for 1,000 inhabitants. On average, cars in Europe are 11 years old. As a point of comparison, um, on average, cars in the USA are 12 years old. A passenger car will have three to four owners on average during its lifetime. Thus, it shouldn't come as too big as a surprise if the supply chain, uh, supply chain changes faced by the automotive aftermarket tend to have um, their own very specific supply chain flavor that uh, differs substantially from most of the other verticals. The goal of this lecture is to outline the supply chain specific changes faced by the automotive aftermarket. In order to do that, this lecture introduces Stuttgart, a fictitious company intended as a supply chain persona dedicated to the automotive aftermarket. Through this persona, I will survey a series of changes faced uh, by uh, this industry. And by the end of this lecture, you should be able to assess whether a supply chain solution intended for this vertical is missing the point or not. Indeed, um, between supply chain textbooks and supply chain software vendors, there is no shortage of methods and technologies that are supposed to address most, uh, if not all, the supply chain changes. Yet, my own personal uh, experience indicates that those general solutions tend to be rather weak when it comes to the nitty-gritty details uh, of a specific vertical. Uh, upon closer inspections, um, though most solutions appear to be chasing some major problems rather than, uh, um, rather than or rather some misunderstood and some mischaracterized uh, problems. The primary automotive market focuses on manufacturing and retailing cars. The relative importance of the automotive aftermarket compared to its primary market is shaped by two aspects that are working in opposite direction. The longevity of the car and the reliability of the car. Uh, longer lasting cars increase the market size of used cars and increase the number of revisions that happen during, on average during the lifetime of a car. On the contrary, the more reliable cars decrease the frequency and the magnitude of the revisions, but also reduce the incentives for car owners to change cars. If a three years old car is good as new, there is very little incentives to actually get a new one. During the last century, car longevity has increased tenfold, while car reliability has increased more than hundredfold. In um, 1920, 100 kilometers was already considered a sizable distance to operate a car without any maintenance of any kind. Nowadays, most cars uh, can operate 10,000 kilometers uh, without a revision. This is a stunning technological achievement, although the improvement of the roads themselves did also contribute to this progress. Modern cars uh, would not exhibit the same reliability if they had to over operate over the dirt road that were commonplace a century ago. This trend is still ongoing. The mechanical components of electric vehicles tend to be even more reliable and longer lived than their gas powered counterparts. Um, at face value, those numbers w could be read as a complete collapse over the course of a century of the automotive aftermarket compared to its primary market. However, the automotive aftermarket um, still represents about half of the profit of the automotive industry. Indeed, uh, putting aside some luxury segment, the uh, primary automotive market is competing um, fiercely on vehicle prices, boosting the relative importance of its aftermarket. This 
series of lectures is dedicated to study and the practice of supply chain. There are more than two dozen lectures that are publicly available online from the local website. It may feel a little bit overwhelming to this audience, however the reality is that supply chains are complex. Those lectures merely reflect um, the pre-existing complexity. Moreover, a modern practice of supply chain must make the most of the software capabilities that are accessible to us nowadays. This is one of the insights behind the quantitative supply chain perspective uh, pioneered by LawCAD a decade ago and presented through this series of uh, lectures. This series has been progressing uh, up to the chapter 7, uh, but today we are revisiting the chapter 3, um, which is dedicated to supply chain personnel. The first chapter is a general overview of supply chain, both as a field of study and as a practice. This chapter is laying the groundwork for the discussion that follow. In this chapter, supply chain gets defined as mastery of optionality when considering the flow of physical goods. We review what um, this definition implies when considering the capabilities of modern software. The second chapter is dedicated to methodologies. Indeed, um, supply chain defeats most naive methodologies. In particular, supply chain requires system thinking. We can't just isolate the parts. We need to take into account the wall. Uh, the also, adversarial behaviors are all over the place. It is not reasonable to expect people inside and outside the company to not have agendas of their own. The third uh, and present chapter uh, uh, is dedicated to supply chain personnel. A supply chain persona is um, uh, represent the methods to study supply chains by starting through uh, an exclusive focus on the problems, purposefully postponing all the discussions that are relative to the solution part. Um, and today our focus is Stuttgart, uh, an automotive aftermarket persona. I will be revisiting this concept of supply chain persona in a minute. The fourth chapter is dedicated to the auxiliary sciences of supply chain. Um, those, supply, those auxiliary sciences are not supply chain per se, yet they are essential for a modern practice of supply chain. Indeed, um, it is not considered anymore a reasonable proposition that a physician can be both um, competent and entirely ignorant of chemistry. In, in the case of supply chain, my proposition is that it should not be considered anymore a reasonable proposition for a supply chain practitioner to be both competent and yet entirely ignorant of software matters. And the fifth chapter is dedicated to Predicting, uh, predictive modeling, indeed a high quality of service almost invariably reflects some kind of anticipation of the future. Time series and time series forecast are the old school way to look at the problem. Predictive modeling represents uh, a more general approach beyond time series and beyond point forecast. In particular, this fifth chapter covers probabilistic forecasting, an approach that embraces uncertainty instead of dismissing it. The uh, sixth chapter is dedicated to decision making. Um, as many if not most of the decisions in supply chain have been to be quantitative in nature, uh, most decision making problems present themselves as mathematical optimization problems. So this sixth chapter covers techniques that are suitable to perform those optimizations, typically leveraging um, those, a predictive model as introduced in the fifth chapter as input. And finally, the seventh chapter is dedicated to the execution of a quantitative supply chain initiative within the company. So far, the tactical perspective has been covered, including the goal, the role, the timeline. I will be revisiting this chapter later to discuss the strategic matters. A supply chain persona is a fictitious company. This persona um, is introduced to shed light on a series of, supply, uh, of specific supply chain problems uh, as they present themselves in a given vertical. The persona postpones entirely all the solution-related discussion to exclusively focus on the problem side of the situation. Indeed, in supply chain, there is no such thing as a solution without an agenda. 
vendors are pushing for solutions that happen to match their software products. Consultants are pushing for solutions that happen to match their competencies. Um, academics are pushing for solutions that happen to match their publications. As, as a methodology, the persona is um, an alternative to the case studies that fare poorly in supply chain. Indeed, in supply chain, case studies are severely undermined by the ever-present adversarial incentives. The fine point of this argument is presented in the second chapter of this series of lecture. A persona is intended to be uh, difficult to craft, but easy to contradict. It's pretty much the opposite of a case study. The persona must resonate with supply chain practitioner of the vertical, no matter um, what solution happened to be in place. Um, the persona must also survey as extensively as possible um, the supply chain problems faced by the company, not just the easy ones that happens to benefit from a supposedly known solution. The persona must quantitatively quantify the silent aspect of the situation. Um, and finally, the persona must um, quantify, um, sorry, must qualify what makes the problem being presented truly difficult. It must outline the sort of conflicting forces that are at play. Thus, let's proceed with um, the persona of interest today. Stuttgart is a fictitious company that operates in the automotive aftermarket. Um, the company was founded in 1970 as an independent brand of repair centers. Unlike the repair centers um, of the car manufacturers that were uh, centered on their own car brand at the time, Stuttgart was uh, founded as a multi-brand repair network from the very start. For 40 years, Stuttgart uh, operated exclusively through its brick and mortar uh, repair centers, growing at, um, as a lower cost alternative to the repair networks of the car manufacturers. Stuttgart, like most of its peers, missed the um, early internet wave of the 2000s and finally decided to move uh, online a decade later um, uh, in 2010 with two online ventures. The first one is dedicated to selling car parts. The second one is um, a marketplace to buy and sell used cars. The e-commerce uh, dedicated to car parts appears simple. People go to the web shop and buy uh, parts that their vehicle need. However, as we will see in, uh, in the following, things are not as simple as they appear. Selling car parts uh, presents a series of specific supply chain challenges. Uh, for the used car uh, marketplace, Stuttgart buys um, the cars and refurbishes them before putting them back on sale. Um, the company positioned itself as more than a simple intermediary that operates a marketplace. Stuttgart buys the cars, uh, which lets sellers have uh, control over the exact date when they give up their uh, vehicle. Also, by refurbishing the cars, uh, Stuttgart can sell warranties ranging from one year to three years for the cars being resold. Um, this ensures a more uniform buyer experience uh, and largely mitigates the pitfall of having some customers um, experiencing uh, exceedingly negative buying experience with their newly acquired uh, vehicle and uh, damaging the Stuttgart brand. In terms of workforce, the repair stances still dominate with over 90% of the employees of the group. Uh, however, in terms of revenue, the two other divisions now represent one third of the business with some segment still um, growing. The whole business of Stuttgart um, revolves around cars and car parts. It is obvious that there are many different cars and that there are an even greater number of car parts. In order to organize and potentially optimize the supply chain of Stuttgart, we need to identify to characterize both cars and their parts. Let's start with the cars themselves. How many different cars are there in Europe exactly? This question is important because two different cars may require different parts to be repaired and also two different cars are likely to be valued differently by the market independently from their respective mileage. 
Unfortunately, this question has no immediate answers. Indeed, nowadays, car manufacturers offer a whole series of options for any car that they sell. As a result, if we were to say that two cars are the same, if and only if they have the exact same physical makeup, ignoring the minute divergence caused by the tolerance of the manufacturing process, then we would nearly have as many distinct cars as there are cars uh, in Europe. That is approximately 300 million passenger cars uh, for Europe as a whole. This massive number does not really make sense. Um, there are entire series of cars that are very, very similar. If um, um, even if every unit presents some minor variation, like the color of the paint. Conversely, if we were to say that two cars are the same just because they are sold under the same name, then we would be grossly lumping together cars um, units that are clearly very different. Uh, for example, Volkswagen has been selling its Golf model since 1974. However, this model covers eight generations of cars, the recent ones having, having very little in common with um, the, the earlier ones. The most common way to define what constitutes a distinct type of car uh, consists at looking at, at the cars through the lenses of mechanical compatibility. Um, two cars have the same type if and only if all the parts that fit on one car also fit on the other one. Um, this definition is aligned with the operational needs of the automotive aftermarket. It turned out that there is a short series of specialized companies that precisely survey the automotive aftermarket and establish their own list of distinct car type based on this very definition. Those specialized companies uh, sell their database to automotive aftermarket companies like Stuttgart, typically um, as some kind of subscription, as the databases need to be routinely refreshed. New cars and new parts enter the market all the time. According to those specialized companies, there are over 100,000 distinct car types in Europe. 100,000 is a much lower number than the original 300 million cars, but still quite a large number, especially from a supply chain perspective. Stuttgart is buying one of those subscriptions to support its own operations. Uh, we will revisit the fine print later in this lecture. Alongside the list of car types, Stuttgart also needs the list of distinct car parts. This also begs the question, how many distinct car parts are there in Europe exactly? Again, the answer is not straightforward. Indeed, an easy but incorrect uh, approach would consist of surveying all the part numbers as advertised by car manufacturers. Unfortunately, as the automotive aftermarket represents about half of the profit of car manufacturers, manufacturers uh, car manufacturers have developed a few techniques to extract a little more from this market. One of those techniques consists of segmenting the market according to the willingness to pay of the customers, the car owners. A customer who has purchased a SUV has a greater willingness to pay all things considered equal than a customer that, who has purchased a compact car. If both the SUV and the compact car share the same mechanical part, it is of the interest of the car manufacturer to relabel the power mounted on the SUV under a different part number in order to have this part sold as a spare at a higher price to SUV owners. Unfortunately, this practice interferes with the operations of Stuttgart. Stuttgart positions itself as a competitive alternative to the repair networks of the car manufacturers. Stuttgart does not benefit in acquiring the same parts at a premium price. The two parts are physically identical. If the two parts are physically identical, it is um, in the interest of Stuttgart to buy the cheaper one. The same Specialized companies uh, that survey the list of car types also happen to survey the car parts as well. Those 
parts database attempt, among other things, um, to provide all the necessary information to deduplicate the part numbers uh, and to obtain a, true, uh, a list of truly distinct car parts. According to those specialized companies, there are still over a million distinct car parts in Europe. However, many parts are rare and many parts are not even intended to be ever replaced. Nevertheless, those parts belong to the automotive uh, landscape and thus they add complexity to the operations of Stuttgart. Finally, we have to consider the list of mechanical compatibilities between those 100 um, car types and those 1 million car parts. Indeed, for a given car type, Stuttgart needs to identify which parts happen to be compatible with this vehicle. Um, it turned out that um, the specialized companies selling both the list of car types and the list of car parts also sell the part vehicle compatibility matrix. Uh, data wise, this matrix presents itself as a list of pairs uh, of a car type plus a car part, indicating that there is a mechanical compatibility between the two. In Europe, this list includes over 100 million pairs. Mathematically, this list can be seen as a bipartite graph. Unfortunately, this list is too vast to be empirically verified in full. Um, in practice, based on studies conducted by LOCAD itself, those datasets seem to have about a 3% error rate sp spread roughly equally between the false positive claiming a mechanical compatibility while there is none and uh, the false negatives uh, omitting a mechanical compatibility that actually exists. With those elements in place, let's proceed with the first division of Stuttgart. Repairs represent the traditional segment of the Stuttgart business. The company positions itself as the trusted experts that um, takes care of your car at an affordable price. The, when the operations are adequately executed, Stuttgart earns a durable trust from its customers. The automotive aftermarket is a market of need rather than a market of want. People need their cars to be in working orders. The mission of Stuttgart is to let the maintenance happen with the least amount of friction. The network includes over a thousand repair centers. Repair centers are relatively small business units with less than a dozen employees on average. Customers request both scheduled and unscheduled interventions from the repair centers. Ideally, from the customer perspective, uh, repair centers should be able to serve any request at any point of time. However, each repair center has a limited capacity. Every, for every type of intervention, uh, the repair center can only process so many cars at any point of time. Limits are imposed by the available space, the equipment, and the workforce. Thus, one of the first supply and demand issues to be addressed is the allocation of the workforce. Indeed, while space and equipment can also be modified, um, those represent infrastructure level investment that, are, that cannot usually be uh, adjusted from one day to the next. However, the workforce can be adjusted on a daily basis, on an hourly basis even, by properly scheduling the shifts. Having more mechanics available uh, gives a greater capacity to serve customers, especially their unscheduled requests. Also, uh, however, it also means for the company a greater risk of uh, paying either employees if there is not enough work to keep those mechanics busy. Also, every single mechanic is not qualified for all the operations. It's not just about figuring um, the headcount per day per repair center, but, com but composing a staff on any given day that let the repair center complete all the desirable operation for the day, both scheduled and unscheduled. However, Stuttgart is not entirely passive when it comes to scheduled requests. Indeed, by default, there might be a systematic excess of demand on Saturdays, for example, um, that repair centers can't process. However, Stuttgart can adjust its public pricing by either charging a little more um, during the weekend or charging a little less during the weekday. Choosing one versus the other is a matter of communication. However, 
a careful adjustment of those prices can be used um, by Stuttgart to smooth the demand during the course of the week so that the customer demands follows a little more closely uh, the capacity constraints of um, the repair centers. Picking the right pricing policy to achieve that is a supply chain challenge. Um, moreover, the repair centers are not um, uh, when, when repair centers are not too distant from one another, as it is the case for, rep for many cities that have several repair centers, there is the possibility to reallocate the staff from one repair center to another during the day. If um, a center found itself with an excess of requests, while another center uh, is facing the opposite situation. Deciding whether a last minute reassignment is uh, desirable uh, or, or, or not is another supply chain challenge. As a side note, yield management and dynamic workforce allocation do not traditionally fall under the supply chain umbrella as implemented by many organizations. However, from the quantitative supply chain perspective, the perspective presented in this uh, series of lectures, all the variables that are readily available to create a better, more profitable alignment of demand and supply ought to be part of supply chain. Getting, and now getting back to more traditional supply chain optics, um, many interventions on cars require parts uh, to be available. Thus, Stuttgart must decide which parts should be kept in stock in every repair center. As discussed previously, there are over a million distinct parts in the automotive aftermarket. Keeping all those parts in stock in every location is not a realistic proposition. Thus, the assortment is a largely incomplete selection of parts by necessity. If a part is not readily available in the repair center, um, it has to be ordered from a central part warehouse. This process will be discussed in greater details in a few minutes. However, parts in the repair centers serves two purposes. The first purpose is obvious, to make it possible to perform the repairs on the vehicles. Um, the parts are stocked in the repair centers in order to reduce the mobilization delays for the customers. The second purpose is less obvious, but no less important, to make the repair center look like a nice, colorful, appealing automotive center. Those parts are intended to be prominently put on display and those parts contribute to the merchandising strategy of the repair centers. Those parts are frequently accessories. They are not the primary reason why the customers went to the repair center. In the first place, the customers can be tempted yet to, to take an accessory to improve his or her drive. The optimization of the inventory in the repair center must fulfill those two goals service and merchandising that are only partially aligned. The returns of parts from the repair center to the warehouse is also a concern. Uh, indeed, when considering a vehicle, um, in order to pick the right parts, uh, the staff routinely check the part vehicle compatibility metrics that we discussed previously. Uh, in the past, software used to be provided as CDs and DVDs. Nowadays, it's usually a subscription featuring an online access. Um, indeed, considering the complexity of the automotive market, even the most experienced mechanics don't have any prior experience with many situations. However, the compatibility matrix has errors and ambiguities. As a result, occasionally, um, the mechanic orders the wrong part, shipping parts back and forth costs money, and thus it is not clear that immediately returning a part that turns out to be incompatible is the most economical option. Yet, if a part isn't returned immediately, it is at risk of becoming dormant inventory in the repair center. Indeed, the demand for this specific part might be very low if we look at this one repair center. Thus, Supply chain must decide um, for every part in stock in every repair center if and when it should be sent back to the warehouse. The network of repair centers includes four warehouses. 
The primary purpose of those warehouses is to serve the car parts requested by the representatives. They are daily shipments from the warehouses to the representatives. As there are only four warehouses against 1,000 representatives, each warehouse uh, can afford a much larger assortment of parts in stock than any representative. Warehouses are expected to deliver high quality of service for uh, most parts, um, except the truly long tail ones. Um, any servicing delays uh, means an unhappy customer who won't be able to use um, his or her vehicle on the day it was originally promised by the repair center. The stock held in the warehouse is also used to buffer um, distant suppliers, some of them being in Asia, that have lead times of several months. The operations of the warehouses are complicated by the sheer diversity of parts that comes in many shapes and sizes. Fragile oversized parts like windshields and overly bulky ones uh, like tires typically benefit from special treatment from a logistical perspective. However, logistical concerns are beyond the scope of the present persona. Beyond quality of service, the warehouses are also integral to the um, central purchasing strategy of Stuttgart. By purchasing parts in bulk, typically meeting MOQs, minimal order quantities, or price breaks, Stuttgart can get better unit prices from the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers. Um, achieving low purchase unit price for parts is critical for Stuttgart to remain competitive and profitable. Optimizing um, the warehouse inventory levels involved the, um, of Stuttgart involved the usual mix of uncertain future demand, uncertain future lead times, and the economies of scale associated with um, larger shipments. However, the optimization also features one specific twist that is quite specific of the automotive aftermarket, the mechanical compatibility of parts. Indeed, being out of stock for a given part number is inconsequential if there is a well-stock alternative in the warehouse. The quality of service of the warehouse uh, at the warehouse level should not be read through the direct availability of the part numbers themselves. Instead, the quality of service should be read through the availability of parts that match the intended repairs. Indeed, to some extent, Stuttgart can steer its own stream of requests from one part number to another part number, as long as both part numbers are compatible with the destination vehicle. Um, the, part number, the part vehicle compatibility matrix is, once again, uh, an essential ingredient to perform such a substitution. In many other verticals, cannibalization and substitutions are evasive and difficult to assess. Um, in the automotive aftermarket, however, it's mostly a given. Yet, it starts with a 100, um, a 100 million line uh, data set, this part vehicle compatibility matrix. Even considering a compact in-memory representation, um, the footprint of this data set is one gigabyte or so. Um, this data set is small enough to fit in the memory of a modern computer, but it is still large enough to spell massive computing overhead if every single supply chain um, decision requires a linear scan of this data set. Whatever numerical recipe is ultimately adopted to optimize um, the Stuttgart supply chain, this recipe should treat this compatibility matrix as a first-class algorithmic citizen. The second division of Stuttgart is the parts e-commerce. The car parts e-commerce lets customers uh, buy parts and do their maintenance um, their maintenance operations themselves. Um, to a limited extent, this channel competes with the services provided by the repair network. This explains why Stuttgart entered this market relatively late in its history in 2012, as it didn't have much support from its own organization while doing so. Nevertheless, Stuttgart entered 
this market as online competitors, we are starting to capture sizable market share in several key segments, aggressively seeking uh, better prices, like professional drivers, for example. The first hurdle to overcome uh, for the e-commerce, um, for the e-commerce front end, is to provide reassurance to the customers that the part that they are about to order is mechanically compatible with their vehicle. In, um, for this reason, um, the Stuttgart website start by asking the visitors to identify their vehicle. This method varies uh, depending on the country in Europe. In France, this is typically done by entering the plate number. In Germany, this is typically done by, uh, by providing the HSN and the TSN um, that are two special numbers. In other countries, this can be done in more laborious ways, uh, for example, by specifying the brand and the family, then the model and then the motor type, etc. Once um, the car type has been entered, um, the online catalog is trimmed down to the list of parts that happen to be mechanically compatible. Uh, once more, the part vehicle compatibility matrix plays a critical role here. Once the vehicle has been selected, uh, the customer starts to navigate the e-commerce website uh, toward the type of part of interest, for example, brake pads. Um, the type of part is sometimes referred to as the function. Um, however, for most vehicles, for a given function, there are dozens or more of distinct suppliers that happen to provide a part fulfilling the function. As a side note, when selling car parts online, the lingering errors that exist in the part vehicle compatibility matrix proves to be uh, fairly damaging to the vendor. Indeed, uh, with a brick and mortar repair network, getting the wrong parts um, um, means reordering uh, a new part and one or two days of extra delays. The delay is an inconvenience for the customer, but the resolution uh, of the original error, getting a new part that actually fit on the vehicle, is largely transparent. In the e-commerce case, um, the customers who is not an automotive professional will struggle with the incompatible part and most likely will waste a lot of time trying to figure out what went wrong. A large amount of customer loyalty and goodwill can be lost over a single um, incompatible part. Thus, the car part division um, of Stuttgart is trying, like its competitors, to add its own layers of corrections on top of the part vehicle compatibility matrix as originally provided by the third party specialized company. However, considering that it's a 100 million online data set and that furthermore uh, it evolves by a few percent every year, the task is daunting. At this point, uh, from a supply chain perspective, we observe a whole series of supply chain decisions that must be made for every single uh, part being sold online. First, every part needs a price. However, the price can be made dependent on the lead time being promised. Um, indeed, Stuttgart can offer a short deadline for um, the delivery in exchange of a higher price. Uh, or conversely, can offer a lower price if the customer is amenable to wait a few weeks. The varying price doesn't merely reflect uh, alternative shipment methods. Uh, but also alternative sourcing options available to Stuttgart. If the customer is willing to wait, then Stuttgart can bypass most of the inventory risk and pass some of the savings to the customer, hence lowering the price. Separately, there is also a concern, uh, price-wise, of the customer, uh, of the competitor's prices. I will be getting back to that in a minute. Second, on top of a price, every part needs a rank. Indeed, on the website for a vehicle type, for every function, there is a list of compatible parts. Frequently, there are a dozen of them. Thus, the display rank uh, within the web page has a significant impact on the purchasing behaviors of the customers, especially if the parts are similarly priced. 
indeed parts at the top of the list um, again this is a web page tend to get the bulk of the sales conversely parts at the bottom of the list especially if they are on the second page and thus that they require an extra click get much fewer sales in addition to the rank um, many online stores leverage additional markers like uh, marking some parts as starred uh, or first choice or top seller again the classical perspective on supply chain would not consider the attribution of um, those visual markers as supply chain problem, but probably as a marketing problem. However, those markers have a sizable impact on the level of demand generated for a specific part within the selection. Those markers can both mitigate or amplify a supply chain issue. Um, the ranks and markers uh, can accelerate the sales of an overstock part, and mitigating the issue or they can accelerate the sales of a part that is already out of stock, hence amplifying the issue. Supply chain is about profitably balancing the demand generated by the company and um, the, the supply it can deliver. Stock-wise, the problems of the e-commerce um, of the e-commerce division of Stuttgart are somewhat similar to the one faced by its warehouses. The online store can leverage the central purchasing unit of the repair network to gain access to better prices. However, the online store has its own fulfillment center, uh, which is optimized for numerous orders. Each order involves only a few parts on average, uh, three or four. The storage capacity of the fulfillment center is limited as it, leverage, um, as it leverages a chaotic storage system. Uh, it has been designed for throughput, uh, not storage density. Thus, Stuttgart must decide the exact list of parts that are ready to be shipped through the chaotic storage system. Uh, conceptually, whenever a part has been shipped, there is a newly available slot in the chaotic storage system. However, uh, slow moving inventory invariably creeps in. When this happens, Stuttgart has several options at its disposal. Stuttgart can remove the parts from the fulfillment center, putting it back uh, in a warehouse, which is a more appropriate place for slow movers. Or Stuttgart can promote the parts either by price or by rank or by some markers, as discussed previously. When Stuttgart sells a part, it uh, promises a specific item, but also a delivery date. Ultimately, due to unforeseen events, Stuttgart may, found, um, may sometimes find itself unable to fulfill the original promises. However, if a compatible part happens to be available, or even better, if a slightly more expensive compatible part happens to be available, then Stuttgart can propose to the customer a replacement at no cost for the part. Um, Deciding whether the customer um, whether the, the customer loyalty to be gained is worth the commercial gesture is um, in part sales, in part marketing concern. However, this substitution is also um, uh, a supply chain concern as it diminishes the stock level of another part and may in turn generate uh, another stock out situation. Thus, addressing this question of substitution is not uh, is a supply chain concern just as well as it is a marketing and sales concern. Now, as promised, um, let's get back to the prices of the parts. Stuttgart leverages leverages a competitive intelligence specialist to get all the part prices of its key competitors on a daily basis, typically scrap, um, uh, scrapping their websites. This is done um, uh, automatically on a daily basis and those competitors are responding in kind by extracting the prices of Stuttgart on a daily basis from its website as well. Let's do a thought experiment and see what happens when Stuttgart positions its prices against the one of its competitors. For a given part, if Stuttgart exceeds the price offered by competitors, then Stuttgart will slowly but surely lose its market share. Indeed, most competitors may not compare the prices every single time, but they all do it occasionally. 
and they will switch to the competition if Stuttgart proves to be an uncompetitive option. Conversely, if Stuttgart underprices a competitor, then this competitor will most likely seek to align its prices. Indeed, this competitor has its own competitive intelligence specialist, and this competitor will detect the lower price from Stuttgart and will attempt to fix the price gap. If Stuttgart in turn attempt to maintain the price gap, then this competitor will keep lowering its prices even further. The net result of this is a price war leading to vanishing margins for both Stuttgart and its competitor. Thus, if both overpricing and underpricing led to detrimental situations for Stuttgart, its default pricing strategy should be to seek pricing alignment. And this insight is not a pure matter of game theory. Seeking pricing alignment is, in the real world, um, the dominant strategy for most companies operating in the automotive aftermarket. However, once more, the part vehicle compatibility metrics intervenes to complicate the price alignment strategy. Stuttgart is only selling a fraction of the 1 million plus parts that are available in the automotive aftermarket. Indeed, Thanks to the mechanical compatibilities, it only takes a fraction of the whole list of parts, about 100,000 parts, to serve almost the entire automotive market. The competitors of Stuttgart are doing the same. They too are only selling a fraction of the whole list of parts, and as a result, uh, many if not most of the parts sold by competitors are not sold by Stuttgart, and conversely, many if not most of the parts sold by Stuttgart are not sold by any given competitor. However, at the end of the day, both Stuttgart and its competitors are putting offers on display that compete for the same need, um, the same function in a given vehicle that requires replacement. Thus, the price alignment perspective remains valid, although it cannot be implemented through a naive one-to-one -one part comparison strategy. The used car e-commerce is the third division of Stuttgart. The used, par, um, the used car e-commerce let people buy and sell cars. Historically, Stuttgart uh, could have entered the second-hand uh, car market earlier than 2010 through a brick-and-mortar approach. Yet it didn't because its network of repair centers wasn't a good fit for, buy, for, for uh, buying and selling cars. Repair centers aren't large enough to accommodate many park vehicles. Um, the park places are used to accommodate vehicle pending interventions or pending the customer to come back to pick um, the vehicle. Thus, Stuttgart entered this market relatively late in 2010 as an online player leveraging his brand to gain market awareness. Unlike the first generation of online marketplaces that let people directly buy, um, directly transact with one another, Stuttgart buys used car on one side and then resell them on the other side. This approach let Stuttgart add value in multiple ways. On the buying side, that is people who want to sell a vehicle to Stuttgart, Stuttgart provides an instant buy service for those customers. This removes um, un the uncertainty both in terms of delays and in terms of price um, to sell the vehicle. On the selling side, people want to buy a vehicle, Stuttgart refurbishes the vehicle and provides a one two-year or three-year warranty for the vehicles. Once again, this removes some of the uncertainty associated with the risk of car breakdown, uh, a risk um, that grows with the mileage of the vehicle. From a supply chain perspective, uh, this is a fairly unusual uh, situation. Uh, the Stuttgart, uh, by the way, I think I, I got the wrong, side, uh, wrong slide. From a supply chain perspective, um, this is uh, an unusual situation. Stuttgart operates an inventory of cars uh, where each item, a vehicle, has its own unique set of attributes, not merely the car type and its options, but also its mileage and its overall state of wear. In order to replenish uh, its car inventory, Stuttgart can't pass purchase orders. Instead, Stuttgart uh, advertise its marketplace, and then it waits for people to propose their vehicles to be acquired. Uh, 
Stuttgart provides an instant online um, non-contractual quotation service. If a customer confirms his interest the non uh, for the non-binding estimate, this person can have an expert provided by Stuttgart uh, to inspect the vehicle and finalize the offer for this vehicle. The higher the buy price offered by Stuttgart, the better the odds that the customer will take the offer. However, a higher buy price also means a smaller margins and possibly longer delays to resell the vehicle afterward. Um, thus, the supply chain practice of uh, this division at Stuttgart boils down to two core numerical recipes, a buy-side quotation recipe and a sell-side quotation recipe. The buy-side recipe tells Stuttgart what price points is to be offered to a customer presenting his vehicle. The sell-side recipe tells Stuttgart what price point to put on display for every single vehicle that happens to be in the inventory. The two numerical recipes are fundamentally coupled. There is no such thing as a good buy price if Stuttgart can't pro profitably resell um, the vehicle afterwards. Similarly, there is no such thing as a good sell price if customers aren't willing to acquire a fresh vehicle at this price. In Europe, each country has its own specialized companies to, that establish what is supposed to be um, the fair market value of each ve vehicle, taking into account the mileage and the options. In, in France, that would be the Argus, and in Germany, that would be uh, the DAT, D-I-T. Um, Stuttgart acquires the pricing data set sold by those companies. However, to a large extent, Stuttgart is in the business of outperforming what is supposed to be the fair market value of cars. Indeed, Stuttgart can use its own historical data um, to refine those prices beyond what those traditional companies can do. Those, this situation illustrates once more why pricing should be considered an aspect of the supply chain practice. Here, um, the inventory reflects the prices established by Stuttgart. Moreover, the inventory rotations are also largely governed by those prices. Most vehicles um, sold by Stuttgart could have been sold at a slightly higher price if Stuttgart had been willing to keep the vehicle in stock for a longer duration. Um, pricing is also, um, is also particularly uh, challenging for this division because there is no, uh, because no price works in isolation. Buy price can't be decoupled from sell prices, but a vehicle can't even be decoupled from the other vehicles. Um, indeed, a buy price uh, for Stuttgart must be appreciated with regard to the other opportunities that arise in the future. If Stuttgart faces a spike of buy opportunities, the company may not have um, the liquidity, the cash, to purchase all the vehicles that are being presented, even if the prices appear to be low enough to be turned into profitable transactions. In this case, Stuttgart must prioritize its investments, dynamically lowering its buy prices, as it can afford to lose a higher fraction of those opportunities. Conversely, every vehicle put on display by Stuttgart competes with other vehicles. Lowering the sale price of one uh, vehicle can vastly increase the odds of finding one customer for this vehicle on this one marketplace operated by Stuttgart. However, this operation might be a pure effect of cannibalization if the customer would have bought another vehicle within the Stuttgart marketplace anyway. The supply chain practice of Stuttgart must embrace those cannibalizations and substitution as they shape its pricing strategies, no matter what those strategies turn out to be. Um, and on top of the vehicle itself, Stuttgart offers a minimum one-year warranty on the vehicle itself. This warranty lets Stuttgart resell the cars at a higher price compared to pure customer-to-customer -customer transactions. Thus, uh, Stuttgart uh, refurbishes the cars before reselling them. As there is no complete technical diagnosis prior to the acquisition, but a simple inspection, there is an element of uncertainty uh, in how many parts will be needed to complete the refurbishing operation for each newly acquired vehicle. 
an accurate anticipation of the parts that will be needed to refurbish the car is important in order to adjust the buy price accordingly. Um, furthermore, when reselling the car, the two-year or three-year um, warranty extensions must also be priced properly, factoring the risk of um, breakdown as its, um, and its associated cost, which can go up to providing a full replacement vehicle. The supply chain practice at Stuttgart uh, is the obvious candidate within the company to assess what boils down to um, probable future supply chain costs. Thus, even if the supply chain practice it doesn't have the final say on um, what the pricing of those warranties um, it uh, happens to be, um, it certainly must be involved to make sure that the warranty isn't sold at a loss. And finally, as a minor but a lot more conventional supply chain challenge, um, Stuttgart, um, this, this third division of Stuttgart, must also maintain an adequate inventory of parts to support the refurbishing operations themselves. Although it is largely a non-issue if, refurbishing, if refurbishing a car takes one or two additional days to complete, Stuttgart must ensure that the mechanics conducting the operations do not end up stuck and idle waiting for parts to resume their works. As we have now surveyed the free division of Stuttgart, um, let's, go, let's step back uh, for a minute. We have approached the automotive aftermarket through a series of assumptions. We have assumed that there was a list of car types. We have assumed that there was a list of car parts. And we have assumed that there was a matrix that connects those two lists, uh, including the mechanical compatibilities indicating the mechanical compatibilities. Um, uh, there are effectively, in Europe, specialized companies that sell those data sets precisely. Those assumptions aren't without merit. However, those lists aren't the only way to look at the problem. There might be other ways, better ways even. Indeed, let's reconsider the list of 100,000 car types. Does it really feel like that there is such a staggering diversity of cars in Europe? Um, my casual observations in the streets of Paris, London and Berlin would rather indicate that a few, dozen, uh, a few dozens of cars seems to represent the bulk of the market. Moreover, on a closer inspection of the technical makeup of those cars, um, uh, we can see that the situation might not nearly be as complex as it appears. For example, if we look at the braking systems of passenger cars, it happened that in Europe, nearly all passenger cars share the same half a dozen of braking systems. A relatively small number of variations, the engine, the gearbox, the braking system, the steering system, result in an explosive number of combinations, hence 100,000 car types. If we are looking at the complete enumeration of all the mechanical combinations that have ever been put to production. Um, anecdotally, such a combinatorial explain, uh, explosion uh, would nicely explain why mechanics in repair centers can operate at all without spending um, uh, the entire days uh, reading technical manuals. Every car that a mechanic encounters might be a unique combination of parts that he may never encounter again in his careers. However, the mechanic most likely already has some prior experience with every single um, subsystem in the car. Back to the braking system, if there were 100,000 distinct braking systems, it would take several lifetimes for a mechanic to become familiar with all of them. But if there are less than 10, then it can be done in a matter of weeks. A flat list of cars ignores entirely all the internal mechanical structure of the cars. As a result, every, mini every uh, minute mechanical variation within the car requires a new car type to be added to the list. Worse, for every uh, newly introduced car type, a complete list of parts that happen to be compatible needs to be added as well to the part vehicle compatibility matrix. This typically represents over a thousand extra lines that are nearly identical to the lines that were associated to the previous car type. From an 
informational perspective, the part vehicle compatibility matrix is an extremely verbose way to represent mechanical compatibilities. Whereas the why is lost. Neither the list nor the matrix convey um, key technical insights such as the pad brake is incompatible with this vehicle because uh, the pad brake belongs to an entirely different braking system. It turned out that there are better, more concise and more manageable ways to represent mechanical compatibilities. Um, ontologies which are a way to organize and structure the knowledge we have about entities, not just in the automotive aftermarket, can be used as a superior replacement of the plain extensive listing um, that um, I have presented today. Ontologies can be used to revisit every single uh, situation discussed today that involve mechanical compatibilities. Ontologies are beyond the scope of Stuttgart to study the um, supply chain persona uh, as persona are exclusively de dedicated to framing the problems, not discussing their potential solutions. However, I am making a minor intentional exception here with ontologies to illustrate how difficult it is to even think about a problem if you don't have a corresponding solution in mind. Indeed, operating through a list of car types and through a list of car parts may seem like a given, a fact, until you realize it is not. It is an abstraction. It is a simplistic approach that comes with at least one severe drawback. Everything has to go through the lenses of a gigantic matrix that involves 100 million lines. This large dataset complicates everything as far as supply chain software is concerned. Worse, this complexity is largely accidental. The real intrinsic complexity of the part vehicle compatibilities is several orders of magnitude lower. In a persona, the very definition of the objects of interest are also, to some extent, part of the problem itself. Supply chain textbooks and, um, and supply chain textbooks and most supply chain software typically jump right into um, supposedly generally applicable solutions like safety stocks, buffers, time series forecasts, or service levels. The adequacy of those solutions is rarely challenged. And when it is, it is usually about inconsequential technicalities, um, like going for weekly forecasts instead of monthly forecasts, or picking the May P, the mean absolute percentage error, rather than the MAC, the mean square error. This is missing the forest for the trees. When dealing with spare car parts, the vehicles themselves are the true, consumer, uh, are the true consumers of parts, not the people owning the vehicles. Mechanical compatibility is not some kind of analytical refinement to be applied on a pre-existing method. It should be the starting point. It should be at the very core of the method. Through the Stuttgart persona, this um, should have become relatively self-evident at this point. Furthermore, in this series of lectures, I approach pricing as an aspect of the supply chain practice. Pricing always shapes the demand, but the relative importance of pricing compared to other concerns varies from one vertical to the next. The Stuttgart persona presents um, for its used car division a rather extreme case where inventory optimization is almost a pure matter of pricing. In terms of used car, Stuttgart doesn't get to pick any quantity. It only picks the prices. And this concludes this lecture. Today, we have surveyed the supply chain challenges of Stuttgart, a fictitious company operating in the automotive aftermarket. In the next lecture, which will happen on Wednesday, January 11th, we will revisit the predictive modeling chapter. That is the fifth chapter. I will be uh, covering uh, lead times. Indeed, lead times deserve a probabilistic forecast just as much as the demand does. We'll see how probabilistic lead times forecasts can be combined with probabilistic demand forecasts. We will also review how future events like stockouts have, that have yet to come um, should be integrated into the predictive modeling approach. Indeed, in this series of lectures, we're looking for programmatic paradigms uh, to address entire classes of supply chain situation, not for a list of, uh, of models. And now I will be uh, proceeding with um, the questions.
Sorry. Uh, okay. One second. Okay. Murphy's Law, my password has expired, so I. Uh, Okay, we are back. Um, a first question from Konstantin Avramenko. Electric vehicles have fewer parts and not so much compatibility across producers. Would inventory management one day become simpler, that, simpler than it is now? This is, um, this is a very, very good question. Um, as I said, there has been like a century-old trend to have vehicles that are um, the, that basically live longer with um, uh, with less repairs per kilometer to be to, uh, per kilometers uh, um, of of travel. So that means that um, when uh, when you have more reliable vehicles, and especially if they have uh, more parts, it it diminishes the importance of the automotive aftermarket compared to the primary market. But as you point out, uh, there are other forces at play. Um, first, electric vehicles, are, it's likely to be, uh, I would say, a, uh, a whole new area with many competing standards. And thus, there will be tons of parts that are likely to be introduced. So even if each car has fewer parts, if there is dozens of um, of car manufacturers that try to establish their own standards uh, that might actually quite create quite a lot of, of, um, of extra parts. Plus, um, they will be considering that parts are very, very long lived. We, uh, that's, uh, that's always that cars are fairly long lived. There will be probably at least two or three decades of overlaps between uh, electric vehicles and gas powered uh, vehicles. So ultimately, you know, if we think one century ahead, Yes, it might become uh, it might become kind of easier. Although you see, it's interesting because when it becomes easier, it means cheaper, and thus suddenly it may become uh, possible for car manufacturer to envision uh, an even greater diversity of cars. After all, you know, if you have less distinct um, parts, then you can think of 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 providing, I would say, a greater diversity of type of cars to your, to your customers. You see, again, um, maybe there is, um, there is added value to be found in having greater diversity. That being said, you know, I'm not an oracle. I'm just uh, about what, will, what this um, automotive market will look like decades from now. I'm just saying that uh, it can go both ways. And, um, and overall, I would be exceedingly surprised if it has become, you know, two or three decades from now, a simple market. It is just so gigantic and there will be so much leftover. I mean, the, the, the gas powered vehicles are still manufactured today. They will be, you know, they will be operating of, uh, on the roads for, for the decades to come. So it may ultimately get simpler, but uh, it might not happen during our, my own lifetime. A question from uh, Alexei Tikhonov. Um, you say that compatibility data has about 3% errors. Is there a way to find those errors automatically? Um, the short answer is yes, there is. Uh, uh, but it's a very, very tricky proposition because fundamentally what I'm saying, it is fundamentally what is known as an unsupervised uh, machine learning problem. You have a data set of compatibilities, you know, this adjacency matrix, and the thing is that it's all you have. You don't have, this is not like a supervised learning problem where you have uh, incorrect examples. You only have you know, this, this agency list, which is supposed to be the, the correct one. But it turned out that it's actually possible, uh, and I might actually visit the technique uh, in, in a later lecture, it is actually possible to engineer an unsupervised machine learning algorithm to automatically um, detect false positive and false negative, and that's exactly what LOCAD does, 
And we actually even, with, with a client, we even benchmarked the case um, uh, where the client just gave us a short list that had been removed uh, of, of, uh, of, um, of compatibilities that has been removed from the original data set to, you know, test whether the unsupervised algorithm was working or not. And yes, it is working. And that's how we were, um, uh, w we were able to get this assessment. Uh, but, but I would say this is the, the topic is too complex to be addressed in this uh, Q&A session, so that will be left for another lecture. Another question from Konstantin uh, Avramenko. Can you share how you come up with um, a personal example and with all the detail that you present? Um, yes, those personal are literally the algamation of uh, many clients that Locat has. Locat has been serving for over decades um, companies in the automotive aftermarket. Uh, and, uh, and although the sort of data and, and, and data points that I've presented today are not, I would say, secrets, uh, I made sure that when I was picking those numbers to pick uh, public companies that publish tons of information that makes tons of information publicly available online, so I could you know, merge those information with the experience that I've acquired at Locad to you know, forge a credible personnel. But so the, the bottom line, and, and that's true for this persona, but this is also true for all the other personas that I've presented. The recipe is the same. Locat serves a series of companies of a given vertical. We have experience. We did, you know, we, we, we struggled intensely with those changes. We, we, we tested many solutions. Uh, some of them turned out to be better than others, but uh, again, Every solution comes with an agenda, but uh, through those persona, I try to, uh, to basically uh, present what were the, the, the core challenge that we faced. And, and frequently, it took us years to even fully grasp what the problem actually was. Um, and then concerning the numbers, as I say, I did not use you know, any number. Locat has access to a lot of extremely confidential data trusted by our clients. I'm not using those data for those uh, personally, I always check that there are sources online that, uh, that provide the number that I present. And, and basically, this is a construction. So I typically readjust the numbers so that it makes sense with regard to the scale of the persona that I'm, that I'm crafting. Excellent. So my, uh, the next lecture will be on, on January 11th. That will be a Wednesday, same time of the day, 3 p.m. Paris. See you then.